people, when stuff is no longer on the homework, somehow the class starts to get a little more empty. Amazing. All right, today is going to be the last class lecture on sort of topics that we're lecturing on. Uh, next, next week we have a brief summary, not summary, but a brief presentation about some ongoing themes in AI. And essentially, Zach and I are each going to present a little bit of work about what we're doing in the field of AI. Uh, so hopefully that'll be interesting as well, but it's less of, a, less of a lecture like these and more just sort of an, an exposition of current and ongoing research. So today we'll finish up the sort of the, the, the meat of the, uh, of the class. The other couple announcements first, uh, I, I believe actually we're still having a little trouble getting one of the graders up. One of them's up now finally, um, but one of them isn't yet. Uh, but they should be there and you should have the, the assignment out for, at least the, the description of the assignment out for a while, so hopefully that's all, that's all okay. But the auto grader should be up very soon um, for the other problems. And, and hopefully that isn't causing a problem. If, if, if it has caused a big problem and like you can't, you know, you have to front load all, you were going to front load all your work, but you couldn't, uh, let us know if you, if you have any issues like that. Um, I was also thinking of having additional office hours on Monday. Okay. Need so yeah, so, so maybe we'll just post on Piazza or that we're going to have additional office hours uh, in advance of the, of the assignment being due. And then a week from today also, in addition to the homework being due, uh, you'll also be giving your two minute presentations in class. So don't spend too much time on those, it is just two minutes, but, but you know, you're gonna want to, uh, to impress everyone else about what you've done with your project. All right, so today, any, any questions before I get started? Okay. Let's jump right into game theory. This lecture is going to be on game theory, and, and the sort of highlighting point here is the computational aspect. Though really, the computational aspect is often what makes game theory interesting to a lot of these computer scientists. And unfortunately, we're actually not going to spend that much time on the computational part. We're really going to talk about game theory. And it's a pretty basic introduction. So people that have maybe already seen some game theory, this might be largely review. But hopefully they'll learn you know, one or two new things and, and if nothing else get to go through some, some sort of new uh, or get to go through some, revisit some old ideas. So the basic outline of the lecture is going to be, I'm going to start off by just showing some familiar games. And this is things like, like, like the Prisoner's Dilemma, which who here has heard of the Prisoner's Dilemma or know exactly what that means? Okay, so pretty much everyone. Uh, not everyone, but almost everyone. Um, we'll, we'll go through that. You'll see it again. And then we'll take, do, do one more game, which actually I should get to, get to answer the game and get to compete and see if you can find the right solution. Then we'll talk about um, basic game theory, just some co concepts and definitions here. And this is just basically things like uh, strategies, mixed strategies, and Nash equilibrium. We'll talk about then, which is sort of the computational element, which is this, this part of computing equilibria. How do we actually go about computing these things? It was not known until fairly recently how hard these were to compute. And so we'll talk about this. Uh, and then we'll talk, we have time, about a couple special cases and extensions. Um, though this, if we don't get on this, this is sort of okay. It's, it's in the uh, slides. These are going to be the, sort of the, the main points of the lecture today. All right, so let's jump right into some basic games. So here is the game that we all know and love that everyone talks about when you introduce game theory. It's the prisoner's dilemma. And um, I assume, as a, most people said they didn't know what this was, which is fine. Um, but to, to recap, and for those who might not have heard of it, maybe have not heard of it before, the idea is you and someone else are trapped or caught by the police. You've committed some crime, um, and you have a choice. You can either stay silent, not say anything to, your, to the police, or you can implicate the other person and say it was all that guy or girl. Um, if you both and, and, and this game is described by a matrix that looks like this. This kind of form of games is going to be something that would come up a lot in class today. The idea is these entries here correspond to possible actions you can take. So you are, say, on the rows here, and your accomplice is on the columns here. You have two actions. You can stay silent or you can implicate them. And then they similarly have two actions. They can stay silent or implicate you. And for each of these different choices, th this uh, entry in the table here corresponds to the outcome and the reward, or cost in this case, that you suffer from that. And what these numbers mean here is this first number is the reward, or if it's negative, the cost, 
given to the row player, and the second one is the reward or cost given to the column player. So essentially, if you stay silent, you suffer a penalty of one year in jail if you, if this person stays silent too, or five years in jail if they implicate you. Similarly, if you implicate the other person and they stay silent, you spend zero years in jail and they spend five years in jail. Right? And if you both implicate each other, you spend three years in jail each. Now, the famous part about this game, what sort of makes it a great example, is the best thing for you both to do is to stay silent, right? Then you each get a year in jail, and everything's, everything's not great, maybe, but good, right? Hypothetically speaking about spending a year in jail, I guess. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, if you both, but, but the, the problem, though, is that if you consider just your actions and look at what you can do, it is never beneficial for you to actually stay silent. Because if they stay silent, then you do better by implicating them. Whereas if they implicate you, you still do better by implicating them. So no matter what, you should implicate them if you are being a selfish, you know, self-interested agent. Um, despite the fact that it's in your, both your best interest to actually both stay silent. So this is kind of the, this is sort of this, this interesting case here. This is why it's always used as an introduction to game theory. And we'll talk about exactly what this kind of means in a second, but just what I'm showing here is just sort of the basic form of the game how we're going to write games like this, and kind of the, the basic concepts that, that, that are going to be present in a lot of this lecture. So are there any questions sort of about the basic presentation here? Okay. Let's try one more game then, which actually, maybe fewer people have seen this one. It's called Guess Two Thirds the Mean. We're going to play this game, actually. The idea is, you all can pick a number between one to ten, an integer, inclusive, no fractions. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to guess the number that is going to be closest to two-thirds of everyone else's guess. Okay? It's so not what everyone else guesses. Not, not, not the mean of what everyone else guesses, but actually two-thirds of what everyone else guesses. That's what you want to guess. Um, and if there are many people that get the same number, which there probably are going to be, but there have to be, in fact, by this, <laughs> If more than one person gets the right number, then it goes to one of them kind of randomly. Okay? Does, that, does the game make sense, at least? So I'm going to take all your numbers, you say. I'm going to take the mean of them. Whoever is closest to two-thirds of that mean, rounded to the nearest integer, wins. So let's play. Get out your uh, piazza course. Where's my cursor? Oh, no, it's gone. <laughs> there we go. OK, so now it should be published. Can people access it? Yeah. You're just thinking very hard. <laughs> Shouldn't think this that hard about this one. <laughs> Great thing about this is there's there's no right answer beforehand, right? We don't know what the right answer is until everyone plays. Actually, show of hands, who has, who has seen this game before? Okay. Good. That makes it a lot more interesting if people haven't played it before. Actually, it's, as long as only a few people have played it before, it's equally interesting then still. All right, so there's 18 votes. You have until the next changes to, to, get, to get your votes in. Uh, it's going to be fewer than normal, I know, because it's kind of a sparse class toward the end of the semester when things aren't on the homeworks, but... Ten more seconds. Everyone vote. Is anyone still waiting to, to vote? Okay. Let's close it then. Close the poll. Okay. 
So, 23 votes. Let's see what the results are. All right. <laughs> so one person guessed nine, which is a crazy guess here. Um, that certainly is wrong, right? Because <laughs> even if everyone guessed 10, which you shouldn't do, uh, one person would have, you still couldn't be right. You still have to be seven or, or, or lower. Um, a lot of people guess one, which is a great answer, but let's actually see what the right answer is here. Um, so let's see. Uh, actually, can someone just read off to me what the answers are? You, you can see it, right, on your, on your thing. So how many people voted one? 15. How many people voted two? How many people voted what other ones? There's only a few other ones. Four? Four, four. four times four. One plus five. Uh, five. And then what else? And one nine. Nine, okay. And there were 23 total votes, right? Uh, oops. Okay, so people have guessed two, one. Because it's, or, or the answer is 2.13 is the mean. Two-thirds of that is still close. Well, actually, is it closer to one or closer to two? Okay, now maybe closer to one. So people to guess one, one. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking it was going to pull up right above, right above two. Um, okay, so, so if we play it again, what will people vote? Just show of hands. Who would vote for one if we play it again? Okay, pretty much everyone, right? And, and it kind of makes sense if you would vote for one, right? Because when you think about it, you would never vote for anything above seven, right? Because that, that could not possibly be right. So therefore, no one's going to vote above seven. That means you couldn't vote for anything that's five or above. And so you just keep cutting in two thirds until the only actual equilibrium point here is everyone votes on one, and you all have an equal chance of winning. Uh, in fact, we were good enough this time where we all got it the first time. Um, but actually, I probably wouldn't have guessed one if I would play. I would have guessed two had I played. Um, because people that haven't played the game before often don't go through this process. And so actually, um, you have a good chance of being sort of that one person to, you know, take the, account for the fact there are going to be some people up here and sort of, you know, use that fact and maybe get right with two. And it almost was, I really wish it had been two. Um, I should have voted for like ten just to, just to throw off the, the mean a little bit. But, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's also another thing. So what's really cool here is that it just doesn't just matter. Clearly, rationally, and if you play this multiple times, what will happen is everyone will converge to playing one. But what's happening here is you have to account not just for the fact that you know you 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 are acting on your own on your own behalf, but the fact you have to sort of think about what other people are going to do as well, right? And are they going to be optimal? Maybe they won't be optimal. What what should you do? So it's a really interesting kind of scenario here because you have to really think about not just what your most, you know, the, what, what the correct answer is in some sense, but what the best answer is practically. So both these games, in some sense, they're kind of different from what we've considered so far in class, in that they do, in class we've sort of been talking about a single agent acting, right? Where we have some, maybe some, and maybe you're acting temporally, maybe you're acting, uh, you know, with continuous actions, with discrete actions, but you're still kind of acting on your own to increase maybe your, your value or your reward or something like this. This is kind of the MDP framework. You're, you know, you're acting to increase your own reward. Um, but in game theory, you have to think not only about your own actions, but about the actions of others. And meanwhile, by the way, the others are all thinking about your actions and, and goes on to infinity, right? So you have to account for all these things. And game theory provides a framework for dealing with these kind of issues. Now we're going to uh, focus on a few very special cases here. First of all, we're going to focus on what's called non-cooperative game theory, which does not mean you can't cooperate. It's sort of a bad name because it doesn't mean you don't cooperate with people. It just means that you are a self-interested agent. So for example, in the uh, Prisoner's Dilemma case, the solution to that game is actually both of you defecting because as a self-interested agent, you will always pick the action that's better for you, which is always to implicate the other person. Um, Similarly, we're going to talk about games in normal form, which is just essentially that the form you saw before. It's just what, all that it means here is that it's kind of one-shot games. We're not talking about sequential games. We're not talking about things that take multiple turns. You just each have one action you take. We see the outcome. You can't see anyone else's move before you take your move. So that's just the, the form of the game. So let's start by introducing some some basic uh, principles here. Oops, I, there we go. Okay, so I'll start talking about some basic game theory now. 
And here we'll go over things like uh, strategies and mixed strategies, and then and finally Nash equilibrium. All right, so first of all, to start off with, a normal form game is a game defined by a tuple of this form. N, big N, is just the number of players in the game. That'll often actually be two here. We'll talk about oftentimes two player games here. But in general, a normal form game can have N players. And in fact, the game we just saw, the, the two thirds of the mean game, uh, everyone was a player in that. So there were, in this case, 23 players. And it's indexed by, we're going to use, going to use I to index between different players. There's also a set of actions that each player can take. And so A here is the cross product of all different sets of actions where AI is going to be the set of actions available to player I. So in the prisoner's dilemma, the set of actions was the same for both players. It was either uh, be silent or implicate the other person. But sometimes actions can be different. So sometimes one player will have a different set of actions than another player. There's no need for these to be the same thing. And finally, there is a utility function, U, that maps from a set of actions, so that's a set of uh, an action for each player, to a set of utilities. I don't know what, yeah, to, sorry, to, to a set of n utilities, one utility for each agent. So for example, um, if your set of actions in, actually maybe I'll just wait because I think I have it on the next slide, but if um, your set of actions is the, the set of all moves, that, uh, the set of assignments of, of all the moves to, to each player, then the utility gives you a resulting value that each player attains from that. So maybe let's look at some examples here. The symbols would be the prisoner's dilemma, right? This was this case here where we had, the, not the simplest, but a simple one is the prisoner's dilemma. Um, we could take these actions, so the set of all actions really, A here really is the set of um, silent or implicate, Talk is not very good. Oh, there we go. Um, time, silence, or implicate. Right? Because each agent can either do that one or the other. There's two games, so n equals two. And our utility here is just spelled out explicitly for each possible combination. So, for example, if little a, I'm going to use, use, typically use little a to talk about an assignment to, to the values here. So, for example, little a here could be uh, equal to. Um, I'll put actually in parentheses here, can be equal to, they both stay silent. Uh, and in that case, you each get a utility of negative one. Similarly, you could make, if A, the first guy is silent and the next guy implicates, um, then the first guy suffers a, a five years in jail, the, the, the second guy, no, player two suffers no penalty. Uh, and similarly for all of these. So this is just an example of the definition of these things. So you should think of use here as taking as input a specific set of actions for each player and outputting a vector of utilities for each agent. Okay, so u is a vector valued function. We'll often refer to the individual utilities for each agent and that's just written like this. So ui of a would be the utility that the ith agent gets. So u1a here would just be the first element in all these vectors. U2A would just be the second element in all those vectors. Okay? Let's look at one more. Um, this is the guess two thirds of the mean. Actually, no, we have a few more. This is the guess two thirds of the mean property. Um, here, n is arbitrary. It can be as big as you want, but in this class it was 23. Uh, A here is the set of all numbers of all integers from 1 to 10 n different times, so, so to the n. Right? And I'm running the utility now. Uh, I'm actually going to write it in its individual form because this is the same utility that every other actor, every agent gets the same, has the same function for its utility. Um, but what it is, and this is a little bit um, convoluted here, but essentially if AI, that's the action of the ith agent, if that is equal to the brackets that's been rounded, two-thirds times the mean of all the actions, then you get a utility that is proportional to the number of other uh, agents that also pick that thing, right? Because you, once, you, once you actually um, pick that, you, you know, 
divide up the pool of people that pick the right number, flip a coin, and see who gets it. And um, this is just sort of that way of doing that. One thing that's important to, to note here is that this is in some sense the, ex or exactly, in fact, the expected utility that you would get, right? What really happens is that of the, of the pool of people that guess the right number, one of them randomly wins, right? And everyone else gets nothing. But because that part is random, an expectation that's just going to be one over the number of people that guess the right answer. And so your utility in some sense you can just think of as being equal to this fraction here because that is your expected utility you will get when you take that action. That's actually a pretty complex form of utility, right? I mean, it depends a lot on what the other people do. It's not like your action is just independent. It depends highly on what everyone else does. The same is, of course, true for the prisoner's dilemma, but it's a lot harder just to sort of see it immediately here. But it's easily defined and, and perfectly well defined to write it like this. Let's talk about a few more games now. Um, another very famous one, which probably you have also seen if you've taken any game theory, is called The Battle of the Sexes. And it's about a husband and wife that want to go see a movie um, for their evening plans. And the husband wants to see, <laughs> I love these names here, the husband, husband wants, to see, wants to see Wondrous Love, which is a romantic comedy, and the wife wants to see Lethal Weapon, which is an action movie. They're always flipped like that, by the way. It's always, it's always that way in any modern, modern book. Um, now they each have, the important point here is that they each want to see a different movie. Right? So the husband wants to see Wondrous Love, and the, the wife wants to, wants to see Lethal Weapon. But they both prefer seeing a movie with the other person than going to each to their own theater and watching a movie by themselves. That they don't want to do. So if they both pick Wondrous Love, the husband gets a reward of two, the wife gets a reward of one. If they both pick Lethal Weapon, then the husband gets a reward of one, the wife gets a reward of two. Um, and otherwise, they get rewards of zero. Because if, if they go to different movies, they don't like that. You're, you're, there's no point in going to a movie, really, if you're going to go to different theaters, right? Um, now, this is a, kind of a different character to this problem, because unlike the prisoner's dilemma, I guess everyone can be happy here, and everyone usually can be happy. But there, there are points here, like prisoner's dilemma, where there's no incentive for you to switch, right? So if we sort of landed on this spot here, then there's no incentive for the, the uh, wife here to switch to going to the other one. And there's no incentive for the husband to switch going to the other one, too, certainly. Uh, so they tend to stay at this spot in some sense. And we'll define this a little more formally in a second. Similarly, if they end up over here for whatever reason, there's no incentive for either actor to switch kind of unilaterally because they're not going to get more value. Um, this is sort of similar to the prisoner's dilemma where if they're both defecting, there's no incentive for the other person to switch. So they're just going to end up with less reward. Um, but here it's sort of a nice situation rather than a bad one in that uh, they're, they're both happy, they're both going to a movie. And really the total utility is the same for both of these, so it's just a matter of fairness, I guess, which one you, you end up in. But finally, um, let's talk about one more strategy, where uh, one more game rather, where it isn't nearly as obvious what you could do, which is another game everyone knows. Um, this is rocks, paper, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Uh, everyone knows this game, right? If you have, can do the three, if you get the same thing, no one wins the tie. Otherwise, there are rules for who wins. You know, rock, beat, scissors, etc. Um, but here it's kind of interesting, too. In all the other games we saw, there was a set of fixed strategies that were in some sense the best you could hope for. Right? In Prisoner's Dilemma, if you implicate the other person, that's really the best you can do. Again, it's not the best you can do jointly, but individually, selfishly, it's the best you can do. Similarly, in the um, guess two thirds of the mean, the best you can do is to guess one. If everyone knows the game, understands it, you're just going to guess one, you're going to have equal odds of getting it right. Um, same with the battle of the sexes. The, the, one person can declare, I'm going to this movie unilaterally, and then the other person has to sort of join them. That's in their best interest to do that, to be deterministic. Here, no matter what you do, um, if you're deterministic, you're not going to be in a very good situation, right? Because if you say, I'm going to throw a rock, and I'm always going to throw a rock, the other person just throws paper. And if you say, I'm going to 
always do this, then then uh, the other person can always beat you, right? So so it's actually pretty obvious what to do here too, right? The strategy you should do is you should just pick randomly. You can't do better than that, um, and you will in fact always uh, want to randomize because if you ever have any strategy that is not perfectly random, the other person can exploit that to actually win, right? That's the basic principle here, and um, probably also pretty intuitive to everyone. But it's a, this does kind of drive home an interesting point in that, unlike the other games, you cannot win this game by playing a fix or what's called actually a pure strategy. You have to randomize over your actions in order to, in some sense, win this game. Any questions so far? Okay. Now there are a few special cases too, which we're going to actually come by later if we get to it. Um, a zero-sum game is a game where the rewards of one agent are always the negative of the rewards of the other agent. This comes up a lot and actually almost any, for example, um, any kind of game we think of as being a game can actually be, be thought of like this. Uh, any kind of board game or anything like that is going to be a zero-sum game because if one person wins, the person loses. Uh, there, there's no sort of in-between there. You don't both win playing, playing checkers or something like that. Again, I'm not talking about turn-based games here, but we're just talking about, uh, just talking about games where, where um, we have one, one shot each. So, so the rock, paper, scissors, this, this is a zero-sum game, right? Because these things always sum to zero. The two rewards in each case sum to zero. Similarly, a coordination game is one game that comes up sometimes. This is a game where the payoffs for each player are always the same for all players. Uh, this is kind of an interesting game because there isn't really much to be done here, you would think. You just want to try to arrive on a similar picking the same thing, right? So for example, uh, or picking something that is, that is, I guess, coordinated to give you the highest reward possible. So this is a game called, I think, like Side of the Road or something like that, where uh, you want to know what side of the road to drive on. If you drive on the right and I drive on the right, we're all good, we're happy. If I drive on the left, you drive on the left, we're still all happy. There's no real difference there. There's no real reason why we want one over the other. But if you drive on the right and I drive on the left, that's probably not a very good thing to do. Uh, so we're both unhappy then. All right, so all that really has to be done here is just arrive on a consensus that we both agree to pick, say, the right side of the road to drive on. All right, so now let's talk about a little bit more formal definitions um, and how we actually go about kind of formally defining what a solution to these games really is. So first off, a strategy for player I, which we're going to write as SI. This is going to be a mapping from the player's actions to a probability distribution. So we're going to think of this as a function that maps from their actions, which come from some set AI, remember, to 0, 1. And the sum over all the actions has to equal 1. So really just, just think of this like a vector. I mean, it's written as a function here, but just the SIs are vectors, right? So the SI is a vector. And I'll write it as, as R here, but of course the, num the, the entries have to have certain constraints here. It's a vector that's of size however many actions you have. It just states the probability of picking that action. So if you have two actions and you always pick the first action, this would be your strategy. If you randomize between them, Equally, you'd have that strategy. And similarly, you can have any other sort of weighting you want. And you can, of course, also have, uh, you know, if you have more than two actions, you can have distributions over all of those. So, so these have to sum to one. So I'll write that as you know, one transpose S of I has to equal one. So if you sum them all up, this entries have to equal one. Kind of similar to our, a lot of things we've seen, like the probabilities in, in uh, uh, graphical models and things like our uh, uh, integer programming problems. And also finally, SI 
has to be greater than or equal to zero. Each element has to be bigger than or equal to zero. Importantly here, this captures both deterministic and pure and mixed strategies because you can have a, a, a strategy that either puts all its weight, all its probability mass on one element or one that randomizes between actions. So you can capture both the right strategy for the prisoner's dilemma as well as the right strategy for rock, paper, scissors using this kind of method here. Now secondly, a strategy profile, and I'll try to be careful about this, calling a set of strategies always a strategy profile when you have a strategy for each different agent. That's just going to be a set of all different strategies for all the agents. And finally, the support of a strategy is just the set of actions that have non-zero probability under that strategy. So for this strategy, the support would be 1 and 2, whereas for this strategy, the support would just be 1. And just definitions again, if it has support of size 1, that's a pure strategy, otherwise it's a mixed strategy. Because otherwise you have to be randomizing between over, over different actions. Alright, now let's just keep chugging through some definitions here, uh, or some, through some notation I guess. Um, we're going to write the probability of, an, of a set of actions under the strategy profile S, like this. So this takes as input a set of actions for each agent and outputs the probability of picking that set given this profile of strategies. And because these are all independent, that just equals the product over all the strategies of that action. Uh, of AI. So now we can also define the expected utility of a strategy. That's just the expected utility we get when we get that strategy. This is not a single quantity now because now there's some randomization here. But it's really simple in a lot of ways to define this. You just look at um, all the possible cross products of actions you could take and multiply the utility of that, of that set of actions times the probability of that set of actions under the strategy profile. And finally, you can also write this thing if you want element by element. Um, this would define now the ith element of the strategy profile, and I'll just expand out the, the definition up top, but it's all pretty simple. Kind of all what you would expect, right? All right, any questions so far? Okay. I'm going to define one more thing now before I talk about equilibrium in these games, and that is the notion of best response. This is also a very intuitive notion. Um, first of all, I'm going to define S minus I to be a strategy profile that has all the strategies except the ith one. So basically just take out the ith profile from that. It's really just notational. Um, sorry, take out the ith strategy from that. Um, and what the best response is, is the best response, um, given a strategy profile S minus I, is what is my best strategy to take given that I know the fixed strategy of everyone else? Or not, not, I shouldn't say fixed. Um, not that it's determined. It, they aren't pure strategies. It's just that given everyone else having a set, possibly mixed strategy, what is the best strategy I can take? Right, and so the way we write that is we say that um, the best response for a strategy two or given a strategy profile S minus I, that is some strategy S I star. If and only if, or such that, um, the utility of S I star and S minus I. So now this is now a utility um, defined for all, sorry, this is I. So my utility 
um, for this strategy and everyone else's strategy is better, at least greater than or equal to, the utility that, sorry, utility SI, S minus I, um, for all SI that I could take. So of all strategies that are available to me, given someone else's, given, given everyone else's set of fixed strategies, the best response is the best strategy I can take. So for example, if we're playing rocks, paper, scissors, an S2 strategy is to always throw a rock, what would the best response of the other strategy be? This is the diagram here. So what would my best response to that strategy be? What numbers go here? Someone knows this, right? Why is it one, zero, one? Oh, I meant to write zero there. That's why everyone's confused. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> That's a little better. What's my best response to that? Yeah. So if I know you're always going to throw rock, I should probably throw uh, paper. What if this is the random strategy? What's my best response? Same thing? So who, said that, who said that? Yeah. That's actually, to, that, that, that's right. It doesn't matter. Everything's the best response. Because no matter what you do, you're going to win with the same exact probability. You, your, your utility, they're going to be equal here. It's not going to be greater than. But no matter what you do, you're going to have the same expected utility as any other thing. So if I always throw a rock here, I'll win a third of the time. I'll tie a third of the time, I'll lose a third of the time. If I have any other distribution of reactions, it's exactly the same. All right, so my utility is the same. So every single uh, strategy here is a best response to this strategy. That seems a little bit incomplete somehow, right? We're simply we're missing something. I don't know what we're missing that, you know, because this seems like we should do this in response. But we'll get to that in a second. Now, of course, the other thing is that in general, we don't know what someone else is going to do beforehand, right? So this is not a good way of defining what's the best thing to do, because this assumes that we are given everyone else's strategy. And the whole point of game theory, of course, is that we don't know what other people are doing. We want to figure out what's the best thing to do a priori in some sense, without knowing what everyone else is doing. And this brings us finally to the concept, concept of, of Nash equilibrium. And the definition here is, 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 again, very intuitive. It just says that a strategy profile, S, that is, is a Nash equilibrium, uh, is a Nash equilibrium, if every SI is A, and I, know I say A, not V, because there can be more than one best response. If every SI is a best response to the other strategies. So if for all I, SI is best response to S minus I. And this is sort of a satisfying definition finally, right? Because in some sense, this sort of corresponds to something kind of rational in that there's no reason for any agent to switch what they're doing if you're in a Nash equilibrium, right? Because they gain no advantage from changing their actions. 
Now, we, we've seen before that it could be that they don't have any disadvantage either if everyone else stays fixed. Um, but if they, that can cause other problems because then if you, if you change, then your opponents can change, etc. So what Nash equilibrium defines is a case where no one will, everyone is the best response to everyone else. And what that means is that no one will gain advantage by changing. Right, so I think what people were pointing to with the one-thirds being in both times is that that is, in fact, a Nash equilibrium of that game. Because in that case, I shouldn't have erased it, but in this case, and S2 equals this, This guy is a best response to S1, and S1 is also a best response to S2. Right? If, on the other hand, we picked anything for the best response here, this would no longer be a best response to that. So once we break that sort of symmetry there, we lose this, this sort of joint property of each being a best response to the other. There can be more than one Nash equilibrium for a game. So that certainly is possible. Um, what example, actually, have we already seen that might have more than one Nash equilibrium? Yeah? Right. Yep, either one is Nash equilibrium. We'll come to that again in a second, actually. Um, and finally, two more definitions. Um, an equilibrium is a strict Nash equilibrium. If the strategy here is strictly better for agent I than strategy for than, than other strategies for that agent. So not only is it a best response, it's the best response that's unique. And it's a weak Nash otherwise. So weak Nash if you can have for some of them um, them being equal. Alright, so let's just go through a couple examples now. What's the Nash equilibrium here? Is there more than one or just one? Is it strict or not? You can yell it out. I don't have a quiz. I have a quiz for the next one, but not for this one. What was, it, what was the answer? Yeah. Yes. So one down here. So your Nash equilibrium here is this. Uh, S1 never is silent, always implicates. S2 never is silent and always implicates. It's a best for, each of these is a best response to the other, right? Because given the strategy, the best thing you can do is this one. You would only lose out by putting any more weight on S1, right? Because you, if, if this is fixed here, this, say, row here is fixed, you only get do better by doing this. Any other weight you put on this one would only increase your, your time in jail. Um, Expected time in jail, I guess. Um, so they're best responses to each other. And in fact, any strategy you pick, anything that has any even slightly less weight than one here, would of course just make it lower the utility. Um, and so it's a strict Nash equilibrium. Okay. What are the Nash equilibrium here, and are they strict? So we have a question. So we already know that the, the third is a Nash equilibrium. Remember, these are not unique, though. And the question is, is this one also a Nash equilibrium? This is a case where the S1 and S2 are each one half in the first two and zero in the second one. So this is rock, paper, scissors, where you have this in your strategies. Boy, one half. Zero, one half, one half, zero. Oops.
I guess, yeah, the question is here. It's really hard to read. I think until this chalk like breaks in, it's tough to... I want to see how many votes we have yet. 17, okay. The it changes to 17, we'll, we'll be done. 217. All right, everyone ready? Okay. Closing the poll. And show poll results. Okay. So, who wants to argue either way, actually? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So, this thing here, this is not a best response to this, right? Because if, if I'm going to, if I know that my other opponent's going to play rock or paper, always, what would I play? I would actually put all my weight on paper, what I would actually do there. If, 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 if I'm S2, uh, what I would do is I would put all my weight on paper. So I'm going to win half the time then, and tie half the time, which is pretty good, right? It's a lot better than losing some of the time. So this is the best response to that. So in the case of both being one half, uh, the S2 is not a best response to that, so it's not a Nash equilibrium. One more question. Is this point, so all one thirds, a strict or a weak equilibrium? All right, we'll be done in, when that changes, changes to 20. All right, everyone good? 24 of us this time, well, we got one more. Okay, someone at home is seeing that I'm posting all these, uh, <laughs> these polls and answering them really quickly. Okay, so uh, it was like two thirds and one third. Who wants to make an argument here for one or the other? Yeah. Right. So, so that's what we sort of argued before, right? If this is all one thirds, then everything you can do is a best response to that. If there is more than one best response, it cannot be a strict Nash equilibrium. It can also be a weak Nash equilibrium. So it's a weak equilibrium. And in fact, as we'll see in a second, and this is kind of a, a subtle but very important part point here, 
is that every mixed strategy has to be a weak Nash equilibrium. If you have a mixed strategy, that has to imply, and you're at an equilibrium point, that has to imply that you couldn't put more weight on one of them and do better, yet you're doing well with that mixture, so actually all utilities have to be the same no matter what mixture you took. Now that just goes for your end, remember. Uh, if you have one third here, anything you pick is the best response to that. They're all the same. And that goes for any mixed strategy as well. If your mixed strategy here is a third, a third, a third, as it is in the Nash equilibrium, it has to be a weak one. And in fact, all these actions have to have equal utility. A pure strategy Nash equilibrium can be either strong or strict or weak, though. Um, but the mixed ones have to always be weak. Does that make sense? Is everyone sort of following that? That point will come back again. So we'll hopefully drive that home again uh, one more time if you haven't seen it yet. Or haven't, haven't. Doesn't, not quite clicking yet. All right. Um, last battle of sexes, really quickly. No, no quiz here. What's the, what, what are the Nash equilibrium? So both people go to see one movie, both people go to see the other movie. Is there anything else? Does anyone know? So it turns out there's another one. Yeah. So here's another Nash equilibrium. S1 is the husband who wants to see wondrous love. If he plays this as it, oops. This as his mixed strategy, two thirds, one third, and the wife plays the opposite, one third, and two thirds. This actually is also a Nash equilibrium. We'll come back to this in a second when we talk about computing these things. So, so if, if, if you aren't following merely why it's Nash equilibrium, that's fine. You, you just do it by computing, is this in fact the best response to that? And you will find that it is. And is this the best response to that? Sort of symmetric, so it has to be. Um, these two, are they strict or not? This one clearly is not strict, right? Because it's, it's a mixed one. Are the other two strict? Yeah? Yeah. They are. Because if you switch, then you're doing worse. So if you put any weight on the other one, you're in fact going to do worse. Interestingly, the value you obtain with this point is not as good as if you do this. Because there's some probability now that you're actually going to end up in, in different movies. Um, so I don't define this. There's a lot of definitions here to, to, to be thought of here. But, but this is, is an equilibrium. It's not what's called a Pareto optimal equilibrium. It's, it's, it's a suboptimal equilibrium point, but it is an equilibrium point still. OK, so, so we talked now for a while about these equilibria. And we had come, went through sort of a, a, a few examples. The, the famous theory, of course, here is that every equilibrium, every game has at least one equilibrium point. Now, this is only, now, importantly, this is only true if you allow for mixed strategies, right? So rock, paper, scissors will not have an equilibrium point if you ref, require everyone to have a pure strategy, because then it will just cycle around, right? You can always come up with the best response to it. Any, any pure strategy, you can come up with a strategy that will dominate that. But if you include mixed equilibria, then every game will have at least one equilibrium point. And this is what John Nash proved in 19... Um, this was in, in, in his thesis, which is 25, was 27 pages, his whole thesis. And this is 27 pages that looked like this. So if you typeset it properly, this would probably be about five really dense pages, which is, as I say here, about the same as your class project write-up. Um, <laughs> he also had two references, and one was to his own paper. <laughs> the other one was, was, was to uh, von Neumann's Minimax paper. Uh, and I think we require more than that for your class project. So 
expect big things out of these class projects, right? Um, and this one, of course, also, this work and similar work, uh, building upon it, won the Nobel Prize in a class project size write-up. Okay, so <laughs> this is great. We're sort of, this is sort of laid a, a very important foundation here, right, for, for the practicality of game theory because these Nash equilibria, and, and they're called Nash equilibria because of this, of course, um, these equilibria, they, they sort of seem like they're kind of these rational solutions, right? They're kind of, they, they make sense. Um, if everyone's there, no one has an advantage of deviating. That seems like what we should do. The tricky part, though, is when we're computer scientists now, how do we actually go about computing these things? Um, up until recently, this was actually not really known how hard this was to do. I say recently, it's been, it's been 10 years now, but almost 10 years. Um, but relatively recently, I remember when I got to grad school, I was told we do not know what the complexity of computing Nash equilibria is. And then it was that same year they actually showed what it was, but still. I remember when this, we didn't know how to do this. Um, so because we're computer scientists, and I think fundamentally because we like to think of you know, reasonable behavior, not just as what kind of is theoretically optimal, but also in terms of what people could reasonably be expected to actually do. Um, and if you can't compute a solution to a game, then the chances are it's not a very good model of what is rational behavior in some sense, right? So maybe it isn't the best solution. If, if we can't compute these things, maybe they aren't actually that good of a model of what it means to be rational or behave rationally in a game. So how do we actually compute Nash equilibria? And you've seen some examples so far that maybe make this seem kind of, kind of straightforward, right? I mean, it's sort of clear. You just you look for them in the game, you sort of see them. But even this last one, uh, this was tricky. This last example, I certainly would not have seen that had I not already and I read about it, right? So <laughs> that's how I realized it was there, frankly. Um, so and, and that's just still a two-player game with two actions, right? How do we actually go about computing these things? Even just one, forget about computing all of them. That's even harder, right? We're actually computing one for a game with, you know, more than just a couple actions, many actions. You can have potentially mixed strategies. So you can have a distribution over all these different actions. How do you determine what the right distribution is? Um, well, this was actually sort of a, a, an open problem for a long time. We had some ideas about this, certainly, and there's some algorithms that can do a reasonable job, but it wasn't certain if they were, in the worst case, exponential or not. I guess it still isn't quite certain, but we have a good reason to believe what it is now. So in 2005, um, this was shown to be in a class of problems called PPAD, uh, which I actually, I'm forgetting what it even stands for right now. Does anyone, does anyone remember what that stands for before? It's uh, parity, uh, and this one's directed. So it's something about finding, finding a, a path in a directed graph um, that, that matches some parity argument. Not that important. The, the important point is that this is a complexity class. It's not quite the same as NP. So people I presume are familiar with P and MP. Um, it's not quite like MP because unlike NP problems, which really sort of ask you, is this, you know, is this uh, assignment satisfying for these variables, et cetera, um, we know that every game has a Nash equilibrium. So it's not a matter of is there one or not. That's kind of decision questions that, that, that are in NP. Um, here we know it does. The question we have to find it. And so it's actually a little different class called, called this PPAD class, which is, again, not the same as NP, but it's sort of similar in that we think currently that this is not uh, equal to the set of, it's not equal to P, not equal to the set of polynomial time uh, algorithms for which there's a polynomial time solution, so problems for which there's a polynomial time solution. Um, and in fact, that would be very surprising if it was. Much like NP, it would be kind of surprising if we showed that P equals P pad. So we're not going to talk about the, the proof for this. It's actually fairly, fairly involved. Um, but, but sort of good to know that at least recently we were able to quantify the complexity of results like this. I should also say that other similar problems about games are in NP. So for example, the problem of is there more than one equilibrium for this game, that's a that problem that is NP hard. Um, so you can quickly, pretty, pretty easily get NP hard problems out of game theory. Uh, it's just that it's 
finding it is not typically a, a problem that really NP is right for. Of course, the other thing though is that we don't really care in this course, right? We, we, we solve hard, hard problems all the time in this class. Um, <laughs> every search is hard. Mixing programming is hard, right? They're all NP hard problems. Um, we just go ahead and start solving them. And in fact, the way you solve this is very similar to the way we solve a lot of problems in this course, uh, namely through search. So it looks very much like search. I'm not going to give a very detailed explanation about how to solve these things, but I'll hopefully give the, the high level picture and then you can read up the details if, if you want to. Um, though I think actually a lot of the descriptions of this algorithm are, are much more complex than it actually is. So read it up, but then try to figure out what it's actually doing, I guess. All right, so um, there's two steps to this. How we go about computing Nash equilibrium. Um, in the first case, what I want to argue first is that computing a Nash equilibrium is really only the problem of computing the, the support of that equilibrium. So an equilibrium sounds kind of hard, right? Because it's, it's, you know, these values, because if you take on any number between 0 and 1, that kind of seems hard, right? So how do we go about actually finding those? Um, if we have sort of an infinite space to search over, it's seems kind of like the character of an optimization problem. Uh, and one that, by the way, is not convex, so it might be very hard. It turns out, though, that um, the ch problem of finding a natural equilibrium can be reduced to the problem of just finding the support of that equilibrium. So if we know the support, I'll show you now, we can actually compute the equilibrium itself. We can compute the actual mixture over the probabilities for that support they would have to have in order for this thing with this support to be a Nash equilibrium. And so a couple things this can mean is first of all um, if we just care about pure strategies right to pick one this actually is not hard um, because we just search over all possible strategies that player one could take and all possible strategies that player two could take and we're fine. That's just this times that. That's not exponential. That's we're, we're fine with something that size. Um, right, the number of uh, actions A1 times the number of actions A2. The challenge really is when we have these mixed, equal, the, the, these mixed strategies, how do we find those, compute those uh, equilibria? The key idea is going to be, uh, as I said before, if we know the support or can guess what the support is for an equilibrium, then Finding the actual values for the strategy boils down to just a bunch of linear equations. So that's the key idea here. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. And we'll talk about actually how I found that solution um, for the battle of the sexes. Because otherwise it can be kind of hard to see you know, how you actually come up with that. So again, um, this is kind of the first step. First step is given support, find the equilibrium if there is one. Then later we're going to tackle how, well, how do we find the support, right? There's still an exponential number of possible supports you can have. Um, so how do, you, how do you go about doing that? But first let's just attack this problem if we know or can guess what the support is. Okay, so let's, to, to, to show this, let me illustrate this uh, on the battle of the sexes. So I'm going to guess that there is a Nash equilibrium here where the support is both these elements for both the husband and the wife, both players. So they assign, they pick one of these with some non-negative, with some non-zero probability for both of them. Okay? So let's say, in particular, that player one chooses uh, wondrous love with probability p, where p is some number. Okay, now here's the key idea. In order for this to be a Nash equilibrium, it has to be the case that the other player, that for the other player, the utility of both those two actions are the same. Okay? That, 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 that's really the key point there. And it has to be that Right, because otherwise, you would put all your weight on the one that was better. 
you put a little bit more weight on the one that was better. And in fact, you would put all your weight on the one that was better, and you would no longer have a mixed strategy. So you have to be agnostic over about which action you prefer here. And so what we saw with the rock, paper, scissors too, right? At the Nash equilibrium, it actually didn't matter for my best response what I did. They were all the same utility. Well, that actually has to be the case, because if it's not the case, it wouldn't be a mixed strategy anymore. You could always do better by putting all your weight onto one action. So this is the key part here. Player two has to have these two things be equal. But now we can actually compute what these things are in terms of this probability p and use that to compute what this has to be. So in this case, um, we know that u2 of wondrous love equals u2 of lethal weapon. u2 of wondrous love. Okay, so that is p, which is the probability that the first player picks uh, wondrous love times 1, so it's p times 1, plus 1 minus p times 0, right? Because if they pick this one, this utility here would be 0. This equals, well, it's the same the other side, so it's p times 0, uh, plus 1 minus p times 2. All right, and if you solve this, uh, you get p equals 2 thirds. Equals two thirds. Right, it's just one equation here, two thirds of the solution. So then, by symmetry, um, the same argument holds for the husband, but just with the other way around because um, the wife has a higher value for this one. And so this ends up being a Nash equilibrium. This is sort of a simple case because there was, there was only really one equation here that we only ended up having one of these variables come out of. Uh, so that was kind of nice. But the general case is, just, is actually exactly the same. Um, what's going to happen here is that hypothesize some supports. So we're going to have the script A1 being a sub, strict subset of, of the actions A1 and script A2 being a strict subset of the actions A2. Okay? So for this, we know that the utility of A and A prime have to be the same for all A and A prime in A. And that actually gives us the size of A1 minus 1 independent linear equations. Namely, um, the first action in the set has to be equal to the second one, first action has to be equal to the third, first action has to be equal to the, to the utility of the first action has to be equal to the utility of the fourth action, etc. So that gives us, you know, if we have four different actions we can take, that gives us three different equations. Three different non-redundant equations, because of course, you know, the first is equal to the second, second is equal to the third, first is equal to the third, but there's only two independent equations there. So you have the size of A minus one linear constraints there. Here, sorry, here you have the same thing here. Um, for A2, you have A size of A2 minus one linear equations. And then finally, to give you those two more, you have the fact that both of these things have to sum to 1. So those are two more linear equations. Oops, this should be 2 here. Cross that out. Two linear equations. And of course, our unknowns here are the actual weights here, the actual probabilities here. And those are just um, the size of A1 plus the size of A2 of those. So we have uh, this many equations, this many unknowns, this many independent equations, this many unknowns, and so we're good. We can find. For a given support, we can find what the weights actually have to be in order to make this Nash equilibrium. So it's kind of a basic question. What happens here? We know there's only one Nash equilibrium here, or at least we've argued it kind of informally. What happens if I try to come up with a strategy whose support is both being silent and implicating the person? Let's say that player one chooses to be silent with probability p. Do you have a guess what's going to happen? Shouldn't make any sense, right? There should not be a Nash equilibrium with this support. 
Because no matter what you do, you should always put more weight on uh, implicating the person. We'll see what happens. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go through the same thing we did. So we know that for, for two, the uh, utility of being silent has to equal the utility of implicating them, given the fact that this, this has to hold for dashed equilibrium. Um, so let's see what this is. So the prob this, this would be uh, P times negative 1 plus uh, 1 minus P times times negative 5, right? Am I, am I, did I make a mistake here yet? Good? Okay, so this equals that. Um, that has to equal then, uh, sorry, what was that? Yeah, P times 0 plus 1 minus P times negative 3. Okay, so this is negative P plus, or minus 5 plus P plus 5P equals uh, negative 3 minus 3 plus 3P. And what that implies is that P equals 2. So it can't be a probability. So what happens if you pick an incorrect support is you will get a solution where either these are not probabilities, they're not valid probabilities, or they don't all actually have the support you're looking for. One of them is zero in your support. So you have to be consistent, right? You have to just find a solution that is consistent with your chosen support. If you can find that, then you are in fact at an equilibrium point. But if you pick a support that cannot encode an equilibrium, you will not get a consistent solution. And this is in fact the basis for algorithms that actually search for support. This is how they work. So, remember we still do, now we, now we, now we want to go from just, now we know if we know the support we can find our equilibrium. Now we have to find what the support actually is. So, there are, of course the problem being is there are a 2 to the size of AI minus 1 possible supports for each player. Everything could be 0 or 1 except you can't have all zeros. Um, do we have to try them all? Well, in the worst case, yes. That's sort of this theorem of unless p pad equals p. In the worst case, these, these things are exponential time. But as with all the things that we do here, like mixed integer programming and all the other kind of al search algorithms, um, many times we will find a solution much faster. And in fact, the way we solve it, and I'm not going to go into detail of how this is done, um, the way we solve it is a procedure that looks a lot like hill climbing. We're going to, is that watching me? I'll just say it. So, so and this procedure actually is guaranteed to find a solution, importantly for the two player case. When you have more than two players, we're no longer guaranteed to find a solution. You could still find a solution, but it's not guaranteed anymore. Um, but this A hill climbing procedure is guaranteed to find a solution in the case of a two player game. And this goes by the name of the uh, lemke hausen algorithm. And here I'm stating it very imprecisely, namely this part. I'm stating it precisely. <laughs> so, the algorithm is very simple. It's exactly what you would sort of expect. All that we do is we just choose some initial support and then repeat the following. We, well I guess we should probably evaluate it first, but whatever. Choose some initial support. I guess it depends what order you do them in. So, according to some rule, we, assuming it's not feasible, the initial support, we choose to either add, drop, or swap an element from the support. And how we choose that is, of course, the trick to the algorithm. That's how it works. Um, for those that have seen it before, this is exactly the same procedure as what's called the simplex algorithm for integer programming. Sorry, for linear, linear programming. Not integer programming, for linear programming. Um, what this does essentially is it looks to make swaps that minimize some objective, where it isn't clear what the objective should be here, but you can actually use sort of the essentially some kind of violation as a kind of objective and start minimizing that. Um, and you keep doing this, and you keep doing swaps in a certain way, 
that guarantees you don't ever create a cycle, that you're always improving, and you actually will eventually find a equilibrium point. So what you do then is you pick a support, you solve these linear systems here, or with the, you know, the more general ones on the previous slide. See if it's consistent. Do you in fact get a solution that is in your support, that has the support that, that you guess, and where everything's sort of a valid probability, etc. If it is, you're done. You stop. If not, you continue. Now this, as I said, this actually in a two-player case with the right rules here will be guaranteed to find a Nash equilibrium. Importantly, it will find a Nash equilibrium, not all of them. There are equilibrium points that you cannot find with this procedure. Um, they're actually sort of, in, in, in the terminology of these algorithms, they're actually disconnected from uh, sort of the graph that you search from this procedure here. They lie on a completely different graph. Uh, so you won't find all of them necessarily, but you will find at least one. It might take, though, exponential time in the worst case. That is, unless the p pad equals p and there's some other clever way of doing this that we don't know about yet. This algorithm can, in fact, take uh, exponential time in the worst case. But it's very simple. Um, people describe it in terms of these sort of, you know, these polytopes and these, these large uh, simplexes you search over, but I think it's a pretty simple procedure. It's just hill climbing. Just making little swaps. And in this case, those swaps actually work. And we'll give you a solution. OK, so we have, a little, we have only three minutes left. Um, and I had a few special cases and extensions, which I probably actually don't want to spend too much time on. Um, I'll just give the, 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 the high level overview here without focusing on any of the math. The high level overview is that, first of all, um, for more than two players, this wonderful algorithm we had, which we'll find something if it exists, but it might take a long time, but it's usually pretty fast. Um, it doesn't actually give you a solution in the same way. You actually cannot come up with an analog that will always find a solution. So it's sort of too bad. Um, however, just sort of the same kind of procedure of local search, the concept still works there. I mean, you're doing local search over support, hill climbing search. That can still work very well. Another thing that can actually work well, too, is forming um, the equilibrium problem as an optimization problem. We like doing that in this class, right? Calling it an optimization problem. Um, and in here, it's not quite obvious, maybe, why this is a, a correct solution here. Basically, I'm minimizing a sum of the max of the utility of taking a single action versus this whole, uh, or, you know, replacing this element of the, of, the, of the strategy profile with a pure action here. If you're at an equilibrium, this thing will be zero, always, because there's no advantage to picking a different pure strategy over your current mixed strategy. So this will actually always be zero at the optimum. Um, and so if you minimize over all your probability, over all your strategies of this whole thing, um, the minimum will be zero somewhere, because there has to be a Nash equilibrium somewhere. Um, and that is the solution here. Unfortunately, this has all sorts of local optima, and it isn't very easy to optimize. So it's not the best way of doing it. Um, but you can think of it that way. And certain techniques actually build upon the strategy to actually uh, make progress. Of course, it's non-convex and not easy to solve. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which, which I won't actually go through the math at all here, is that there are some special cases you can solve of Nash equilibrium. Uh, an important one being, it was, can solve and can do it in polynomial time, importantly. An important one being two-player zero-sum games. The defining element there is zero-sum games can be thought of as one player trying to minimize a quantity and the other player trying to maximize that same quantity. Um, and that min-max formulation actually lets you formulate it as a convex problem, in fact, a linear program, and solve it that way. And so you can solve these problems, this limited subset of zero-sum games this way. So last lecture of the entire, last sort of content-based lecture of the entire thing, uh, the entire course here. Um, I'm talking about game theory mostly from, a, from sort of a, a uh, theoretical and then algorithmic standpoint. There are, of course, lots of applications, too. Um, a area I work in, actually, a lot, which, is, which, which are applications in the, in the smart grid, have a lot of implications of game theory because things like CO2 emissions actually are very similar to problems like the prisoner's dilemma. It's always better just to keep emitting and you know, build up your economy, uh, even though it's better for everyone if everyone stopped doing that kind of stuff. So there, there are a lot of applications for these things. Um, because everything we do is, in some sense, related to other agents, there's, there's, there's a whole set of problems that can be solved and addressed uh, with techniques like this. And there are actually a lot of faculty here 
who work very extensively in game theory and, and similar areas. So, all right, I will see you on Monday.